Living in Nebraska is boring. It's nothing but farmland, grass, empty roads, and random animals for miles. I needed money to move away to somewhere more inhabited, with better Wi-Fi, and just more things to do besides shoot things and grill steaks. Because of the uncertainty of some big animals popping out of nowhere, I always kept a gun on me. Well, in my routine session of driving for about 100 miles, I managed to find a diner. Generic name, generic paint job. It was the most generic diner imaginable. I pulled into the small parking lot, stepped out of my old pickup truck and walked in. Inside, more of the same from the outside. Walking in, I saw a now hiring sign hanging loosely on the window. Oddly, no gun-free zone signs were on the doors, windows, or anywhere on the exterior. I see you guys are hiring. Where can I apply? I said to myself. You can simply ask for the manager, mister. A waitress replied. It's weird how she heard me, but given that the diner had four patrons at most, she must have heard me talk to myself. Around 7pm, I've been driving for a long while and needing a way to make money. I did just that. A muscular, tattooed, and tall man in a button-down shirt greeted me with a friendly grin and ushered me to a small office space. It reminded me of a utility closet, only bigger. It was barely big enough to hold more than a Walmart office chair, a table for two, and the filing cabinet on the side. So, sir, I see you have your identification, social security card, and other essentials for this. Is this your first job, sir? The muscular man asked. It's my first full-time job. Sold odds and ends to make money. I replied truthfully. Well, sir, I just need to do a standard procedure background check. So, please answer truthfully. He responded, still with a somewhat friendly tone to his voice. I have no criminal record, sir. I answered to his statement entirely truthfully. The muscular man introduced himself as Brian, shook my hand firmly, and looked into his filing cabinet. Well, sir, we do need spots for employees between midnight and 8 a.m. You'll earn 8.25 an hour and your days are Thursday through Monday. Welcome to the crew. Just sign these papers and read the employee manual thoroughly. Brian said firmly yet jovially. A decent paying job, nice quiet hours, and I stepped out to a chair to read the manual. Fairly standard stuff, mostly concerning health and safety. But page three was something I never expected to see. It looked almost like a notebook paper crumpled up and smoothed out as best as possible against a table edge. The rules are as follows. Rule one. If you're taking the trash or recycling out, always bring a flashlight. If none is found, inform the manager immediately. Rule 2. If you're cleaning up something outside between the hours of 2 a.m. and 4 a.m., make sure that you have earbuds in and the volume on maximum. The diner has free Wi-Fi. Rule 3. Under no circumstances is the back door to be opened between 3 and 5 a.m., no truck delivery is ever scheduled between those hours. If a truck is at the back, inform a manager immediately. Rule 4. At all times, must a walkie-talkie be connected to at least three other walkie-talkies be worn and never turned off. If the battery is in a die, wind up the crank on the back and inform everyone what has happened immediately. Rule 5. Once a week, a man in a tattered pair of sweatpants and sweat-stained t-shirt would come in at 2 a.m. If he asked for anything, provide it, no matter how strange or seemingly impossible. Rule 6. There should be four employees on shift during 12 a.m. to 8 a.m. Keep count and remember Rule 4. Rule 7. Under no circumstances should anyone open the door to a group of people greater than five. Inform them that there is an equipment failure and go to the kitchen immediately after saying that and stay there for 15 minutes. Rule 8. 
If a customer comes in and mentions a weird creature in the window, use any means necessary to destroy the creature. There's a gun in the filing cabinet, and it is to be inspected for integrity, and if it is loaded completely. Rule 9. If a rustling sound is heard from the dumpster or recycling bin in the back, use any means necessary to stop it. Fire is a last resort, and a book of matches is under the counter by the cash register. Weird that such a simple place has a strange and unusual rules, I thought to myself. I signed the papers and went back to Brian to inform him. He was busy with a phone call and took the papers without skipping a beat. Sir, your first day is this Thursday, so two days from now. Please head to the door on the right and there should be a clean uniform, a hat, and a walkie-talkie for you. Brian said quietly enough for the person on the other end to not hear. I looked for a shirt my size and a hat that fits my head. A few minutes of searching later, I found them and thanked Brian for the job. Walking out, an employee noticed the walkie-talkie on my hip and shook his head, almost as if he knew what was going on. Thursday eventually came and I arrived at the diner at a quarter to midnight. I had my gun on me and my phone at a full battery, and a backup set of batteries for the walkie-talkie. The beast took a C battery, so it was pretty heavy. I carefully reread the rules to remember them to the letter, and a night shift manager introduced herself. Uh, name's Julie, new guy. Now don't get too ahead of yourself and don't mess around, she said harshly. I'm Hank. Pleased to meet you, I retorted sarcastically. The other employees, a cook with a white scar over his eye, resembling a horse hoof with chunks of metal embedded in it, introduced himself as Jeff. An older, roughly 35-year-old woman with cheap makeup on introduced herself as Henrietta. Well, a moment has passed. It's 12.05 and we have another 8 hours ahead of us. So just follow the rules and get to work. Julie barked coldly, putting earbuds in her ears and playing music fairly loudly. Jeff simply made himself a cup of coffee and time flew by and eventually it became 2.30. Soon after, a faint knock on the back door was heard. Jeff simply fried an egg while dicing some onions and Julie was far from even caring about the noise. I looked at the paper with the rules on it. Between 3 and 5 a.m., it's only 2.40, so who could it possibly be? I asked myself curiously. A loud mechanical click came over the walkie-talkie, and Julie's uncaring voice came over it. Don't open it. Remember rule six, new guy. How could I have forgotten? I must have been too wrapped up with dealing with the trash. I only had ten minutes to deal with it, so I power walked to the dumpster. The hell is that ru- Crap, I muttered, grabbing my walkie-talkie hastily. New guy, it better be important. You have eight minutes to get back. Julie groaned over the sound of loud rock music. There's some rustling in the dumpster, I said shakily. You got a gun, don't you? Roll nine. And also, you followed roll one, right? Julie said with a slight anger and annoyance. Oh man, roll one, I whispered. As I muttered that, a large raccoon poked its head out and scurried off, carrying a half-eaten bit of toast in its mouth. Something peculiar about that raccoon, though. I don't know what. Jeff's walkie-talkie was making mechanical clicks and whirs. Hank, you all right out there? You gotta finish what you're doing quick and hurry back. Unspoken rule, kid. Jeff said, a bit anxious. I just threw the trash bag in the dumpster and ran back inside. I slammed the heavy wooden board lock down and checked the time. 2.59. Nearly three hours and only a single customer who asked for an omelette with spinach and cheese. Nothing else unusual happened for the shaft, so I simply did my duties, drove home, and went to bed. Hopefully tomorrow will be different. Another shift, another adventure became my motto. Venturing inside at 11.40pm after I drived to the diner, a couple things went through my mind. 
something isn't adding up and it's affecting more than at the diner. I drove about 120 miles yesterday and only went to a single gas station. Shouldn't I be out of gas by now? I circled in my thoughts. A quick cup of coffee and preparing my equipment for the shift later. I reread the rules to myself until midnight arrived. Greeting my coworkers with a friendly smile, light conversation and a horribly unfunny joke about eggs and how much they exaggerate situations. My watch read at 12.01 as I started to help Jeff clean the flat top grill. Fairly easy considering Jeff cleans it every hour and a half. Henrietta's voice came over the walkie talkies telling us that she needed a replacement battery. She sounded different. Last night she was only 35 years old, and now she sounds like a kind of old grandmother. She might be simply trying to be silly, but considering the circumstances of the rules and the incident involving time last shift, certainty wasn't exactly in supply or demand. Checking my watch made me doubt my surroundings more. As I finished cleaning the grill at 1210, as I checked the walk lock. My watch, however, said something different. It was off by a minute or two, which isn't too abnormal. Maybe heat does that to watches. While I was gazing at my mechanical watch, the main door in the front opened. The bell jingled and someone walked in. Poking my head up, I saw Henrietta walk to him with a menu. Another thought went through my mind. Why did Julie say Rule 6 involving the door? Rule 6 is keeping count of employees. I wondered, getting distracted. No guy, stop messing around with your daydreaming and go be useful. Or I'll have you clean up pebbles in the parking lot. Julie thunderously yelled, snapping me from my thoughts. Um, yeah, sure thing, boss. I stammered sheepishly. Checking my watch at red at 1.37 a.m. I got spare time to do some window cleaning, and I might as well enjoy the fresh, cool air while I can. Grabbing some Windex, a clean rag, and getting to work, I barely paid attention to the inside of the place. Nearly tripping over a rock, I saw the clock on the wall and went bleached bread white. 1.59. The clock read boldly. How could time have passed so rapidly in the short time that I was cleaning windows? Someone's pulling a prank on me for sure, right? That thought of a childish prank comforted me as I rapidly put my earbuds in my ears and started to blare loud music into my eardrums. I might be unable to hear someone yelling mere fingernails away from my face, but rules are rules. Guys, got earbuds in on maximum volume. I'm outside. I shouted into the walkie-talkie, barely able to hear myself, let alone anything behind gunshots and motor collisions. Resuming my task at hand, the fairly faded windows became crystal clear as I wiped them down after a couple of sprays of Windex. I smiled at my reflection, seeing an average guy smile back at me. Looking up, the night sky was illuminated with millions of stars and the sight of the Milky Way galaxy brought awe to my mind. Looking back at the window, a visibly unamused Julie looked at me with a glare, much like a parent's glare to an obnoxious child. Walking inside, Julie was going to keep it as brief as she normally would. New guy, you didn't hear the walkie-talkie, did you? She spoke through a thinly hidden fury. No, I was outside cleaning the windows. I saw that it was 2 a.m. and remembered the rule where you have to. I spoke softly before getting interrupted. You told people that you were, or am I simply pulling that out of my butt? She seethed through gritted teeth. I did. What was over the... I responded before another interruption. You didn't see anyone in the window, did you? Julie said quieter than usual. I saw my reflection. I answered sheepishly. Julie eased up suddenly and sighed loudly. Soon after, the walkie-talkie started emitting loud radio static. Despite my instinct to turn it off, something caused me to freeze in place. I remembered what rule I would break if I did. 
and it was bound to lead, me getting fired even worse if that happened. Slowly, I inched my hand back from the walkie-talkie and headed back to the kitchen, where Jeff was sitting on a worn, faded plastic crate, looking at something on his phone. Henrietta perked her head from the far end of the kitchen, curiously peeking before returning to cleaning out a coffee cleaner. Something was odd, and it concerned the rules. Why can't I go out the back to deal with the trash between 3 and 5 in the morning? Surely the front wasn't taken into consideration. I have to ask Brian about this whenever he's working at the graveyard shift. How come Jeff said something about unspoken rules last shift? Hey Jeff, you said something about an unspoken rule last shift. What is it? I asked inquisitively. If I told you it wouldn't be in an unspoken rule, Jeff jokingly retorted. So, I assume anyone outside during 3 and 5 a.m. are left there, I whispered to him. Was there anyone working this ship before me? I mumbled to him, worried about the outcome. I can't talk about that right now. I wouldn't ask anyone else if I were you. Jeff spoke in a tone colder than dry ice. Something tells me that it wasn't good, so I checked my watch. 3 a.m., and time must have flown in that conversation. Henrietta offers everyone a cup of coffee and Jeff starts acting like nothing happened. And that's when a faint knocking sound in the back door starts. Almost like someone was scratching at it. Looking around, I saw something very, very strange. Henrietta. Her makeup was sloppily applied and her usual faint lipstick is a bright color. Henrietta tapped me on the shoulder asking what I was looking at. If you were, there should be four employees, right? I whispered in a fright with the words barely escaping my mouth. Henrietta walks to the back door to the knocking. Not even a second after Henrietta and I reached for our walkie-talkies, the back door was opened and jammed to keep itself from closing. Rule number three was broken by an imposter. The other side of the door looked exactly the same as it would normally, but the sky was a tar black, all except for the moon and the night sky, which was glowing a sinister orange. The door, as I came to realize, was a barrier. Julie is shouting her lungs out over the walkie-talkie about the door, and getting fired isn't a big deal right now. Something is going to pick us off one by one. Frankly, I would like to get fired so I don't have to deal with any of this strangeness. Cautiously, I grab a maglite flashlight and step off the back door into the inky abyss. Guys, you think something is out here? I asked over the walkie-talkie. Jeff grabbed a headlamp from a box in the cramped, confined, slightly smelling of mildew office, and the butcher's knife from the kitchen afterwards, trembling slightly in fear. I saw him stare cowardly at something that I couldn't see, and I heard an animalistic hiss. The Henrietta from earlier was glaring at Jeff like a stalking animal, and it was about to catch its prey. I heard Jeff run for dear life and a couple extremely loud gunshots, so I ducked my head to give me some sort of shielding. I heard the sound of a rabbit, cat's hiss, and rapidly fading footsteps and someone grabbed me and threw me away from the back door. New guy, you're not dying on my shift. Maybe someone else's, but definitely not mine. Julie spoke aloud. I saw that she had a Smith & Wesson revolver in her hand, and as quickly as I saw her, she went off to do something, I'm not sure what. But then came dead silence. I could hear the pitter-patter of tiny, insectoid legs and feet across the metal piping, the linoleum tiling, and even the ceramic dishes. Possibly bugs coming in to get away from the cold outside. Hell, I would have a strange comfort in knowing that it was cockroaches, as then I would have knowledge of what it is without even seeing it. Hank, the front is far different. I can see the stars in Milky Way. Heck, even the moon is in evil orange glow. It's like... Henrietta spoke into the walkie-talkie, before it suddenly died in an ear-piercing blast of static, 
I decided to check my phone and turn on the radio to at least have some sense of normalcy. Looking around for the FM radio app, I noticed my phone battery drained far faster than normal for a fairly old phone. Guys, is there a radio? My phone has the ability, but it's dying pretty quickly. I blabbed into the walkie-talkie. Guys, is there a radio? My phone has the ability, but it's dying pretty quickly. Emanated from my walkie-talkie. It sounded exactly like me except... Bestial. No, that couldn't be. I don't sound like a beast, right? I must be hearing things. That or there is a feedback loop from a nearby walkie-talkie which would make sense. Given that everyone on shift has to have one on. But surely that would mean either someone is right behind me or through something basically impossible through the laws of thermodynamics to clone the walkie-talkie. A sudden scratching against the window got my attention, and looking out revealed a peculiar sight. The sight in front of me was a large raccoon, and it was scratching at the window. I thought that it saw its reflection and was attacking it as it was early summer and it was a male raccoon. Somehow, it looked familiar to me, and I looked familiar to the raccoon. It stared at me as my lips were speaking, and it started to speak back. Hank, you need to escape. The raccoon mouthed before scurrying off into the darkness of the night. I think it knows me from somewhere. This is getting out of hand. Am I losing my mind, or is all of this happening? I don't know, and I'm not sure which outcome is the better solution to me. All I heard as I ran to the back was a gunfire and bestial screams. It was hell trying to navigate my way around the suddenly monstrous amounts of clutter sprawling from the ground, and the endless swarms of cockroaches and mice scurrying past my legs. I tripped over my feet in a panic and fell down one of the holes, and saw myself and the raccoon. As I saw myself and the raccoon, I understood something about the familiarity. It's a sense of deja vu, almost like I've seen this all before. Hello? I called into the empty void. Nothing returned. Myself and the raccoon were still talking to each other, and surrounding me was some of the most awe-inspiring sights fathomable. Deep space, billions of stars and planets, infinite possibilities. I soaked all of this in like a sponge in water and marveled at the sights like a child marveling at a superhero in a movie. I took pictures on my phone of it all and I could hear myself and the raccoon talking now. How can this be? The orange moon, the monstrously large stars in the sky hidden by a void. Hank asked the raccoon. I do not know, Hank. I just know that they are related to something beyond a fathom. Something that the human brain simply rejects to acknowledge almost by instinct. The raccoon replied, and with a snap, a whiteboard and a marker appeared. And they started writing on it, and I couldn't understand a single thing on it. It was strange symbols, chemical equations, and many peculiar words littered it. I approached it, and the raccoon saw me. Hank, I'm glad to see you again. Glad you could drop in. The raccoon chuckled slightly, obviously at the horrible pun. What is this place? Who are you and what does any of that mean? I asked the raccoon with nervousness. Hank, you are nowhere and everywhere. I'm the raccoon you saw a night ago. And the symbols. Don't you worry about them. They'll make themselves at home in your brain soon enough. He answered as more symbols appeared on the board. Beneath my feet was the orange moon from earlier, and I could see a pair of impossibly large stars, each with a brown circle surrounded by a perfect black circle. Almost like eyes. No, that's impossible. How can that even work? The orange moon is a light bulb. Hank shouted enthusiastically, as if he had solved a great mystery of the universe. The raccoon scurried to the other Hank quickly and stared at his findings. His face said everything that I needed to know. 
By the universe, you're right. The raccoon shouted in awe. I fell to my knees as preposterous thoughts flooded my mind. Could everything have been a lie? Is everything around me determined to happen? What's real and what isn't? Are my memories my own or were they implanted? The dread set in and my head ran wild with more thoughts. Hank, you don't look so good. Other Hank said firmly, You, you're me and I'm you. Shouldn't a paradox have happened by now? I asked with sheer dread flowing through my veins. Well, it appears none of it matters. Nothing is either of our own and everything is either of our own. Think about it. We can do anything and nothing can or we'll stop up until determined so. The other Hank coldly responded, colder than liquid nitrogen. I could almost see the ice form around his words, and I realized he was right. He could do anything, as well as nothing. I could do anything and nothing. I could feel myself fading in and out simultaneously, both wanting to be and not to be. It was humbling to realize something bigger than myself existed. This is rather humbling to know. It's weird, isn't it? I can find comfort in knowing that something more powerful than the most powerful person imaginable exists. It's a strange feeling, but if that is my own accord is the real question. I retorted to his icy cold words. The eye like stars had these circles within dart around, and I could hear the clicking of a machine. It was almost rhythmic in frequency, and then the clicking of a computer mouse. I wrote on the whiteboard in a connection I made. Everything is merely the typing of a computer. I shouted into the void. Hank, you're onto something. The raccoon interjected as he scampered on my back. I could feel my brain swell with infinite knowledge and I saw other Hank's head explode in a shower of thoughts. I saw it then reform instantly, almost as if by self-preservation instincts alone. The thoughts that I saw were all of my own, and none of my own as well. I had a thought and a hard time in expressing it into words. It was of my family and how they had reacted to the possibility of never seeing me again. Hey, I got a question. Can I leave this place in return? I'm wondering about the people I care about and how they'll react. I asked with a tinge of longing. Well, it's tricky. It is possible to leave and return, but the process of coming back isn't exactly easy. I had a feeling you would ask about telling your family. Well, you could tell them, but they'll never believe you, Raccoon answered, without even turning his head to me. You have the ability to do anything, and all you have to do is think. You have unlimited possibilities. Other Hank followed up with. I'll send a copy of myself in. Just like me before, I got hired at that diner. Hopefully the cycle won't repeat. I said with a spark of realization. Living in Nebraska is boring. It's nothing but farmland, grass, empty roads, and random animals for miles. I needed money to move away to somewhere more inhabited. With better Wi-Fi and just more things to do. Besides, shoot things and grill steaks. Because of the uncertainty of some big animal popping out of nowhere, I always had kept a gun on me. Well, in my routine session of driving for about 100 miles, I had managed to find a diner. Generic name, generic paint job. It was the most generic diner imaginable. I pulled into the small parking lot, stepped out of my old pickup truck and walked in. Inside... More of the same from the outside. Walking in, I saw a now hiring sign hanging loosely on the window. Oddly no gun-free zone signs around the door, windows, or anywhere on the exterior. Something about this place is familiar.